and Judy was, she was in junior high, right? Junior high school, and a missionary came to speak at the worship service on that Sunday. Judy heard that missionary tell stories about, well, how, oh, the dangers of being, uh, being shot by one of the gangs that roamed the countryside or being made to take captive by one of the rebel groups that were trying to overthrow the country and all these exotic places like uh, in, you know, up in Africa and Asia and all, all around the world. And then she also heard from the missionaries some wonderful stories, some great stories about how people came to faith in Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so from that day on, from that moment forward, Judy just knew in her heart that God was calling her to be a missionary. And so she prayed about it, she talked to people about it, you know, almost every chance she had. And she just knew that God was calling her to be a missionary. There's just no doubt, no doubt in her mind. And so when Judy graduated high school, why? Then she went off to a Christian college to learn how to be a missionary, right? To go out in those countries, tell people about the Lord. Well, just about six weeks before she was going to hop on a plane and go out to uh, the mission field in India, why Judy's sister, uh, together with her brother-in-law, when they both died in a pretty bad, tragic car accident. And they left their three kids, three little kids, and the children, they had no one as a small family, there's no one really to take care of them, so they're giving to Judy, you know, to, to care for. Judy said that was... That was just devastating. That just crushed me, you know, like a ton of bricks. You know, I wasn't not being able to be become a missionary, you know. That's the one thing I yearned for, the one thing I yearned for deep in my heart to do that. But she says, there's just no way, you know, I was going to let my uh, sister's kids go into a foster care program. You know, I was their only family, she you know. And so for the next uh, several, several years there, why she became a devoted mother to those three little kids. And she raised them up. She prayed with them every day, told them about the Lord. She made sure they went to worship um, every week, you know. And she just raised them in a, in a caring and a loving Christian home. And after those kids, why they're old enough to go out on their own, why then Judy says, here it is, here's my time. So she tried again to go to full-time ministry as a missionary, only to be told that, you know, you know, now you're too, we think you just do your over the age limit here to go through this long and extensive and rigorous training to go out in a mission field. And so some of her friends, they heard that, you know, and they're telling her, you know, how could God do that to you? You know, how could God again, you know, uh, you know, just uh, close the door to you again? You know, what what kind of God is that? You know, doesn't He care for you? I mean, how unfair is that from God? And Judy thought for a moment after that she heard it, you know, heard this, and she says, "Well, you know, well, my my sister and my and her husband they weren't Christian, you know, and you know, now, well, now they're." Their eldest is a, is a pastor in a church. Their middle child is a teacher in a Christian school. And then their youngest child is really active in her church, too. And so, you know, instead of making one missionary just for me, why the Lord made all four of us missionaries. She said, at first, you know, I was really, really angry at God. Angry at God for doing that. I thought, how would you allow this terrible thing to happen to me? But she says, now I can look I see. Isn't that true with a lot of us, right, in our lives? Something happens, you think, this is the worst thing, God, how you ever let, let me, let this happen in my life? And then, after a while, when you look back, you see how it all plays out for our best. Because that's what her, 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 where Judy was. She says, you know, you know, now I see that God's will for us is, well, not always what we think it, it should be. That God has a, sometimes a different outcome in, in mind, you know, other than the one that we think is right and proper. And that His will, you see, His will is always, always what's best for us. And so this brings us to that reading we just heard from uh, at Old Testament there, where you have King David, right? And King David, here he is in his palace, and he's looking out at it out over the city and in this great big uh, mansion of his and he had all the best stuff right like a king would he had the best uh, furniture the best uh, a tile on the floor the you know the best of everything best roof everything the best and there he is looking out he looks out his window one day scripture says and there he sees this tent 
just a regular old, you know, beat up old tent. But where that in the tent was the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Law of God. That's where it was kept. And that Ark, that's a thing that looked like, well, like I always say that we saw in that Indiana Jones, you know, in the, in the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's just exactly, really, how it looked like. Those angels with the big wings like that spread across the top of it. And inside that ark, there were the stone tablets, you know, the Ten Commandments were, uh, were uh, chiseled on. And that is, is what, that is a sign of God's guidance for his people. And then there is also Aaron's rod, okay, his staff there. That, was a, uh, well, that symbolized God's protection, right? Like Aaron's rod protected them as they traveled through. And then there's also this little bowl of manna in that ark. And manna was the food that God gave them to sustain them as they went through all their 40 years in that desert on their way to the promised land. We see that ark was very important. It was the symbol of God's presence with his people. Okay? Even at a, a, there's even a phrase for that Old Testament. It says God tented with his people. It means he lived with his people. And there it was, just sitting there, that ark in a regular old tent. And King David, he thought that that was, you know, that just wasn't right. And so he wanted to build a house for God that was well, at least as good as, as his palace, right? His own house. After all, he thought to himself, that seems like the, the right thing to do. And that's, that's what it was. So he thought to him, that seems like the right thing to do. But so why didn't think God put a stop to those plans? I and mean, what's wrong then really with giving God our best, right? A, a best furniture, a, a best gold trim? Nothing really. It's just that God's plan, well, that wasn't God's plan. He didn't want to do it that way. But when the time was right, the scriptures tell us why God allowed David's son, Solomon, to do that. He allowed him to build that temple. And so Solomon built this great, great, really great opulent temple. And it lasted for about 350 years until, well, the Babylonian army came around and kind of destroyed most of it. And two things happened at that time when that, when that happened. For, for the temple, one was never rebuilt to that its former glory, like Solomon made it. And then the second thing that happened is that at that time, God's presence, that is, it says, left the temple. The Bible puts it this way. It says that the glory of the Lord left the temple never to return again. And he didn't. Before that time, you always read the scriptures where every once in a while God would come there. You see this great big light, and they could see it. And back at that tapestry, the one that was ripped in half at the crucifixion, uh, that they could see that light coming out of there every once in a while. God's presence. But after that, no, it wasn't anymore. And God left Solomon's temple because, well, that people, they turned that building, right, that great building and what was in it into idols. Okay. They started to revere the things that are in that temple more than they revered a God. And they just couldn't see that, and so they lost everything. It's kind of like what we have to watch that trap as ourselves as Christians. We tend to build these churches, right? And we tend to put all this great stuff in them, right? We have a great big organ, a really whiz bang, you know, set up for our AV, uh, oak, oak uh, pews and everything like that. And then we tend to just fixate on those things instead of coming here and really fixating on God, His Word, praying together, supporting each other as He calls us to live. But now, you see, now the Lord is building Himself, well, a new temple. It says that in the scripture, a new temple, a new home, really, not a house now, made with uh, all those dead and earth things like wood or bricks, like, you know, Solomon built his temple, but a, a warm, a living, a loving home in each and every one of us. For a physical house is really not a home, is it? Not a warm, loving home. And we can see this, and I have two little uh, examples here that say, show, kind of show the difference in a house and a home. And the first example is a house, well, I mean, it looks just great. It could be on the cover of a Sunset magazine. Everybody would want to live in it. It was at the right spot, everything. I mean, the hardwood floors, they were shiny, right? And, and the climate was, was controlled, you know, and uh, the, everything was color-coordinated. 
it was just a great place. The lighting system uh, it kept everything a soft glow, no matter what was going on, you know. As a matter of fact, well, you know, uh, it didn't matter what was happening outside of the house. It was kind of uh, a little kind of uh, blocked off, you know, from the rest of, of the world outside, sealed off from the rest of the world around it. And people in that house, why? Well, they're always there properly dressed. They always said the proper things, you know. They, uh, their teeth had the proper, uh, great smiles and everything, right? Their, their hair was cut the, the right way for the fashion of the day, you know. But when they spoke, huh? Why, they were very careful. They were very careful to mark each word, you know, that they said and to what? what mark every word that was said about them. Very, that's very important to them. They were, they were always on their guard, all, always, you know, cautious about everything. And to watch them kind of interact with each other, right, wonder, well, it kind of reminds us of the old saying, you know, how do porcupines, right, hug each other very carefully like that. That's how they were. And then we come to that second, our second house, right, our second example. And it could have been, well, it could have been on um, one of those uh, spots where where, uh, well, like this, on our shows, like the, this old house, or one of those old renovation shows that they have now on all the TV uh, channels. And so it needed a lot of repair. It needed a lot of, it had a lot of dinks in it, you know, it needed a lot of work. Carpets were kind of bad in this house, you know, maybe a faucet leaked here and there, the bulb was out, stuff like that. And, uh, man, the furniture was kind of maybe garage sale, hmm? and things like that. And people in this house, though, why, they wore jeans, you know, just regular jeans, regular sneakers around. And when they when they talked to each other, why uh, the volume went up, you know, and hands were raised, and voices were raised, and, and you know, and sometimes it got kind of tense, sometimes it got kind of stressful. But then, why did all take a step back, you know, say I love you, hug each other, and then come together and sit and laugh and together and have a meal together? I mean, a big, big difference, you see, <coughs> between that this house and the other one. And so you see that difference in, in these things, in these two houses. We see that a home then is really not a perfect place, is it? A home is where life is lived with all of its challenges that we have to face. It's a, it's a safe place. A safe place where we can lower our defenses on a few places in this world. To lower our defenses and let our real self come out. It's a place of forgiveness. It's a place of acceptance. And it's the type of home that God calls us with, with his help to strive to, to build for our families. And it's the type of loving home that God yearns to create in each and every one of us. And he's doing this really right now. I mean, it's God's Spirit, is not, that comes to us to, to mold us, to, to shape us, to transform us into more Christ-like lives. Hmm? The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit gives us this great joy. It's a joy in our singing and praising God. And they come here like this morning, it's a joy in our living for God, that it becomes a, it's, it's an active thing for us. It's living for God, too, that gives us this joy. And Galatians says the Spirit works with us to develop gentleness and kindness and peace in our lives. I mean, isn't that a wonderful promise from God for all, to all of us? And then Titus tells us why that the Holy Spirit it just washes over us and renews us at our baptisms. And Roman goes on, goes on to say that it is by the awesome power of that Holy Spirit that we are well, we're able to then see, we're able to trust in God's great promises to us of acceptance and love. And that we overflow with that joy of Jesus in our lives because of that forgiveness that he won for us on Calvary's cross. And that, that we are also filled with that sure hope of eternity with spending eternity with our Lord and Savior. And that hope is all the difference in the world. When you meet people out there, they have no hope in the future. They just live in this thing, in this present crazy hot world that we find ourselves in. And so really the question for us might be, are we, 
are we overflowing with that trust, with that joy, with that hope that the scriptures tell us that we should have in the Lord? And if not, maybe we should ask ourselves, why not? For this is God's plan for us. This is how he says he will come and help us. This is how he this is why he created us. And this then is how God is creating this living, loving, you know, and safe home in our hearts and in our families here. Through a close, that close personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, God is not building, you know, an empty shell of a house with us. He is building a full, a living, and a, a loving home, a, a real home He's building with us that will last forever, He tells us. You know, about, three, about, about 300 years ago, there was a story about uh, the kid, Queen of uh, Russia. Her name was Catherine the Great, and she used to call her the Tsarina, right? And she only wanted to hear good things, okay? She just didn't want to hear anything bad that was going around, right? Just want to hear all good things. She wanted to believe that the people, all the people were happy, and all the people really, really loved her. And so whenever she announced she's going to go out to a, a village, you know, a town that's someplace out, outside of Moscow, why she had one of her aides, this guy named Count Potemkin, and he ran around and he put up these empty storefronts, okay, these false, the fake buildings, and then he went around, he got all of these people and he'd pay them off. He'd hire all these people to stand in front of these buildings and he'd put new clothes on them so they were good and they looked good, and he'd hire them just to wave and smile at Catherine as she as she uh, drove by. And so that the queen there in her, in her coach would kind of look out and say, wow, wow, these people, they're really doing great and they're happy. And look at it, they love me. I must be doing a great job. But the only problem to that is what? You know, those villagers were, they were a false front, weren't they? They were fake, they were nothing inside of them. Nice to look at, but not real. Hmm? This is how our life can be. This is how our life is without Christ inside of us. It can be nice to look at on the outside. We can have money and cars and all the best you know, clothes. We can take our vacations. We have a little pile of dough around. And it's just so wonderful. But without Jesus actively in our lives, right, there is no real life in us. There is no eternal life in us. But God, in His grace, has a plan for us. He tells us throughout the Scriptures it's a plan to make a loving, safe home with us, to, to lift up our spirits, you know, when we're down, and to uh, heal our broken hearts, and to forgive all of our flaws, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. And to help us get through all those rough spots in life that we all have and we all have to go through. So that when we find someone, you see, along the way with a need, why we can help them fill it. When we find someone who feels kind of lost and, and hopeless, why we can share that hope that God has given us, you see. For this is what God is all about, is he not? Doesn't he tell us this in his word? He came to Bethlehem, right, 2,000 years ago, right? And that first Christmas, just to live in and among with us, despite all of our shortcomings, all our flaws, that alone is a miracle, huh? And so don't you see, don't you see that miracle in great and grace in that action by God? God has come to make his home with us, you and me. It's not going to be a perfect home, though, uh, as long as we're in this broken place. But it's a home where we can all, uh, where we can, well, have all our issues that can be worked out. They can be resolved. It's a, it's a home where we can, be, where we'll be loved. It's a home where God puts up with us with all of our faults. Um, it's a, he comes and blesses us. He comes and, and helps us change our, our lives to more Christ-like lives. It's a home where where our heart is and where our heart strives to be. It's a home where Jesus Christ has come to live with you and with me. 